Hello and welcome to our channels. Here we are with the wonderful Sal. And today we're going to be talking, we're going to go slightly kind of off on another topic, which is all about hypnosis, the power of language, uh, how it's linked to the ego, etc. Okay. So, Sal, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Looking forward to our little chat today. Mm. Um, primarily because of the work you've done with uh, NLP, hypnotherapy. Yeah. And because this is an area which has interested me for a long time as well. So um, I'd love to engage and communicate our different uh, perceptions. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, when you mentioned the the, the idea of talking about this, you know, I, my ears pricked up because I, I love I love talking about language and I love what I'm what I've seen over the since I learned about language and obviously when you learn NLP you become very aware of the, of of the power of words and what words the intention behind words and what I what I became aware of was the the way that words are used and language is used so brutally to to control people to manipulate people to and f and manipulate for me is not neither good nor bad it's the intention behind it we all manipulate in every conversation we are intending to manipulate the conversation but it's the intention behind it is that a good intention or is it a bad one so what becomes very clear to me as i look for example at the media at politicians etc cetera, etc cetera, sometimes i'm kind of mouth open going wow are they really doing that? But of course they do. Yeah. They do indeed. Um, my my angle is slightly different, although they're not really. Um, for me, it's more about the self and the ego. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that we use language <clears throat> to enslave ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the way that we use language to, um, as you said, control others, but not, not so much control us, because the thing about ego uh, is that ego sees no one but itself. And so language reflects that. It re when we speak with other people, we are reflecting our isolation from others. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we are controlling, but only in the sense that we are controlling objects in our world. Sure. So, and and my interest is in being able to separate from our ego, not because our egos are bad, but because when we're in our egos, we cannot see, famous phrase, the wood for the trees. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's that's where I come from. Okay. Well, let me add to, add to that because it, it my thoughts are very very much in in line with that. When when I've been kind of looking at how the ego works, how it works on us, how how we interact with other people with the ego, um, the ego, yes, is everything is a reference, self reference, and everything is a comparison. The ego only makes comparisons comparisons with yourself how do you compare against other people and um i read somebody said uh, it was a beautiful expression that um making a comparison comparing yourself to others is the the biggest act of violence that you can commit against yourself comparing yourself to others which i thought was lovely because there really is no comparison because we're not we are we are only ourselves. So the only the only person that we can actually genuinely compare ourselves to is our own self. Am I better now than I was last week, last month, last year? That's a great comparison because that helps us to move forward. But am I better than him or her? Oh, that's that's not a great place to be. Mm. It's a difficult one, isn't it? It it is. Yeah. Got, you know uh, because. What is comparing itself? It's just the ego. Mm -hmm. 
And can the ego be better or worse? Well, ego is ego. It's it's a machine. So it cannot truly create a viable comparison in itself because if I am comparing myself, then I am using ego to change myself. Mm -hmm. How can ego know what's better or worse? Ego is ego. Um, I mean, I appreciate that we've got morality and we've got rules and regulations that dictate our whole lives. Yeah. And we use that as a, as a template, but that is very, rel is, that's very relative. You know, what's good to one is not necessarily good mm -hmm. for someone else. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would, anyway, I'm digressing. Yeah. I, I would just say that mm -hmm. what's important for ego is to accept itself. Wherever we are, wherever wherever we are, however good or bad we judge ourselves to be, that's where I am. If I can see that, if I can see myself as I am today, and that is no no mean feat. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But if I can see myself as I am, then my world begins to change, and you know. Love is to see. Where, where everybody speaks of love. I mean, few people understand love. Uh -huh. But love literally means to see without judgment. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. Yeah. So when we can see ourselves as we are today, without judgment, so begins our love affair with ourselves. Sure. We start to accept ourselves. Yeah, I like that expression, that love affair with ourselves. You know, in in the work that I that I do with my, my clients, what I often do is take their emotional pulse. I need to know where they are emotionally, not not mentally, because we think many things that have nothing to do with reality. But the emotion is a great it's a great measurement of where we are. So I get them to say sentences out loud and tell me how true they feel to them. So I, often I get them to say, "I love myself." They have to say it out loud and how how true does that feel? Um, and also, I like myself. So invariably, when people are starting therapy, they tend to score themselves very low on, you know, I love myself. Quite often, they score themselves higher on I love myself than I like myself. Many people don't like who they are. Um, but it's, and I say to them, right, so it, I want you to get to a 10. I want you to love yourself at a 10 and I want you to like yourself at a 10. But, and that's, the, as you were saying with the ego, this is the, just a self-acceptance of warts and all. This is who I am. You know, I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna be somebody different. This is who I am. Um, but that, that love, that level of I love myself has nothing to do with ego at all. It's, the, it's self, you know, the self-appreciation of, hey, this is all I've got. This is who I am. But... But we've been we haven't been taught that in society, you know, somebody, oh, he loves himself. You know, people say, Oh, he loves himself. But true love, <laughs> true love is not I I'll add something just as, as I'm talking about that. When I, I I've done a I've studied what's called a statement analysis. I don't know if you if you've heard of statement analysis. Basically, what it is, it's taking somebody's statement and analyzing it to see whether they're telling the truth or whether they're not. Yep. And there's so much to it. It's very beautiful. But what I do now, and I can't help it, is when I'm when I'm talking to somebody or I'm reading what they've written or whatever, I'm listening for the personal pronouns or which pronouns they're going to use. So lots of people say, well, you know, you, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I was listening to what you said, blah, blah, blah. And then you'll hear some people who only use their own personal pronouns. I, me, myself. And the over you, it's like oh, out of balance. Now I'm, I'm kind of listening for that thing. Of, okay, there's, there's a lack of balance here. You know, if you're talking to somebody else, you should be using their pronouns as much as you're using your own, you know. So it's a it's a, it's an interesting measure of where people are, but yes, we've got to be our our number one fan. Absolutely. Um, so I, I thought we, we might start. That's me. I mean, you'll think something else, but I thought we might start with separating 
the word emotion from the word feeling mm -hmm. because this is central and <clears throat> so people appear to so many people appear to confuse the words in my opinion um so for me emotion is what i experience in my lower abdomen second chakra and this is the movement in motion emotion in movement energy in motion the movement yeah. is movement of electricity through my nervous system it's communication which goes to my uh, hormonal glands to generate an impulse for action mm -hmm. run fight flight yeah relax whatever it is it's a physiological experience of my organism and emotion um and the problem with humanity today for quite a long time is how we have learned to suppress emotion uh -huh. the flow of it its flow and most of the problems in man with mankind at this day and age is because of these emotions that have been arrested in their flow through us mm -hmm. So emotions, they're part of the ego, they're part of the organism. They define us, they define us uh, as a biological entity. Feelings, uh, so for those who are listening, um, focus on the word, let's say for the sake of argument, I'm making this up as I go. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Not very good at this. Uh, focus on the word. I like this. I just choose that one. I like this. Okay. okay. I'll do that. Okay. I like this. Now, focus on the word. I like this. And notice where it's, the focus is in your body. I like this. Just here. Is it there? Okay. I like Maybe it. that's not such a good word then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's focus on something else. Maybe something a little bit more controversial. I hate this. <laughs> Try I hate this. Okay. Okay. It, when when I when I feel hate, it drops further down. It goes lower. Okay. So the place I'm trying to get people to experience is that emotions by their nature are more in the lower abdomen area. So if I now say, well, focus on I accept myself. So you have an image of yourself and now you accept. Now, some people are going to struggle with that. But if they can get past the struggle, uh -huh. focus on something about themselves that they can accept. So you may not be able to accept the whole of you, but there is something about you you accept. So focus on what you can accept. Mm -hmm. And now, where is that focus? Uh -uh. I feel it in my in entire torso here. Okay. Um, I'm not going where you want me to yeah. go. <laughs> no, no. Well, you you are, but not so. Ex it's not so sharply not so defined. Specific, yeah. Um, I I imagined, and I don't know this. I imagined that for most people, there would be a separation, that the feeling of acceptance would be more focused on the upper chest. Uh -huh. Whereas the feeling of hate would be more focused on the lower yeah. abdomen. Definitely, the negative feelings were were, were dropping. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. And the reason what I was trying to get to is that feelings are heart based. Mm -hmm. They emanate from the heart. Okay. Because feelings are beyond the ego. Feelings are not part of the. Um, indoctrinated organism. They're not part of the mechanicalness of the organism. It's feelings is something that by being beyond the ego allows us to communicate with what's beyond us. Mm -hmm. So with feelings, we can put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Whether it's an animal or a human being or a tree or a bird, it doesn't matter. It is the ability to extend our sense of self 
beyond the confines of ourselves to something beyond us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's how I would separate the two. Okay. So feeling is inclusive and emotion is exclusive. It's just me. Sure. Anything to do with emotion is just me, whereas feeling is beyond. Now, it gets complicated because emotion is actually sensation, is sensation, whereas feeling is not sensation. But we say, oh, I feel this table. or So we, we're mixing the words mm -hmm. as we speak. We don't have that clarity. Sure. And so it gets really confusing because most people are not in their hearts anyway. They don't experience the world from their hearts. Uh, instead, they, they experience the world from within their ego, which invariably means that the mind is constantly chitty-chatting, criticizing, and interfering with our perception of the world. We cannot see the world clearly because the words are in the way. Mm -hmm. And even when, when I look at my phone, in my head I'll go, my phone. The words will go, my phone. Sure. So I'm all the time interpreting the environment. I'm interpreting the consensus reality with the words. Yeah. It's a filter. It filters us from the real world. Whereas when we're in our hearts, there is no filter. We experience the world directly because we are directly engaged in the world with the world. Okay. Yeah. And that's really interesting that you've used the word filter because I've just I've got that written down as something I wanted to talk about. So a couple of things that you said. Uh, Anthony DeMello, I don't know if you know the, the guy. He's, he's dead now, but he, but he was a fantastic, fantastic man, um, way ahead of his time. And he would often talk about the way that as <clears throat> soon as children learn the name of something, they stop seeing it. As soon as we put a name on something, it, we then see the name. And and he tells the story of the guru who, who uh, his student says, when when will I be able to be illuminated? And he said, when you can see that tree and just see that it's a tree. And he said, no, but I, I do see your tree. He said, no, you don't. You see a paper tree and you just see some words, you know. Um, and in in NLP, what they talk about is, is the mind's uh, way of filtering, distorting and deleting. We do three things probably as, as a minimum. We probably do more. But when we look at something, our mind is filtering it, it's distorting it, and it's deleting stuff. Why? Because at any one time, we have trillions of pieces of information coming to us. The mind can handle it, the unconscious mind, but the conscious mind can't. The, the conscious mind can only handle, in best terms, seven plus or minus two things. So nine or five things. And after that, it's we're overwhelmed, you know, and we know that when if you've got a lot on your mind, you can't think straight, you can't function. So what happens is the mind is a thing called the reticular activating system and the mind filters everything and it says, right, well, what do you what do you like? What's what are you interested in? What do you like to look at? Right. Well, we'll give you that and we'll delete everything else so you can't see it because it's too much. And not only that, but what do you like? And so, you know, that have you heard of that bias confirmation, which is yeah. uh, you will only get to see what you believe in. You know, the expression, I'll believe it when I see it, is the wrong way around. It's I'll see it when I believe it. That's the truth of the matter. And so the mind then filters all of that. So you'll only get what confirms your beliefs. So what they've found in studies, and, and I've been trying to find this study, but I listened to a guy who did this study, and they find that the information we take in, by the time it's gone through the filters, only 20% of that information has anything to do with reality. And 80% of it is either invented, distorted. So what happens is that when we take information in, we think that we've understood, but what, what our mind's done is just distorted 80% of it. And then, of course, if we then pass that information on to somebody else, 
they're listening and they're distorting 80% of the 20%. So by the, you know, it's Chinese whispers. By the time that three people have shared some information, it's not the same information. Once we understand that, when, when I understood that, it set me free. I was free. I felt finally free because I didn't feel tied to believe what I believed. I, I, I was free to say what I believe is just my impression of something has nothing to do with the truth whatsoever. And that's a lovely place to be, to be able to think, I don't need to really, really believe what, I'm, what I've got in my mind. It's just a perception, you know? And then I see people who kill for the beliefs. And I think that's a real shame because if you knew that your beliefs have nothing to do with the truth, you know, we haven't got the capacity. Yeah. We, we don't have the capacity to understand the truth because of what happens in our mind. And unfortunately, we are all being manipulated by the one who go conspiracy theory, but but by the powers that be, those who have the uh, the levers of uh, communication and power, they they literally herd humanity so that they will believe what these other people, their interests, what they're interested in, the herd will follow. Sure. And they've been doing this for a long, long time. And this is this is how they do it, which is rather unfortunate. And then you ask, why do people believe this thing? You know, that for a long time, that really troubled me. Why is this person of a particular religious denomination, we'll just say that, why are they willing to go out there to kill and destroy other people? Uh, I mean, I could have said political, it's the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, why do they take such stock of everything they've, they've heard and believed and now they take it on board like, how does that happen that this person grows up and now they've got this intensity of perception that allows them to go and destroy someone else because their perception is different. It's like it's like a virus across the, the centuries that infects people, mm. and people take on board and they're consumed by it. I, I I could never really get my head around that, to be honest. Mm. Uh, sure, but that's what happens. Sure. You, you know what one of um I mean you you were saying, well, you know, let's it's it's it might be a conspiracy theory. It truly isn't. When when you've studied the manipulation, the use of words to manipulate, and you know, especially in hypnosis, obviously I, you know, when you know hypnotic language, it stands out and it's used constantly. But the premise is everything's hypnosis. Everything is hypnosis. So again, that sets you free once you understand that, because yes, the powers that be are using manipulative language, of course, but so am I, so are you, so is everybody. So the question is, the, the, the way that we keep ourselves safe is just by being aware of it. Hypnosis can only happen when you're not aware. Even wake, I mean, the most dangerous hypnosis is waking hypnosis. You know, uh, I'll give you an example of waking hypnosis, a very typical one, when somebody goes, oh, oh, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. And then loads of people in the room start yawning. Yeah, that's hypnosis. That's, I'm going to transfer onto you tiredness. And, you know, it's kind of like, it's what happens. This is, you know, you're asking, why do people do this? Why do they go? Why do people yawn when you yawn? We're joined, we're linked, and, and therefore people people's communication affects us very, very deeply when we're not aware of it. But when we be, as soon as we become aware, when you know the television is going to give you propaganda, you watch out for it. It stands out and you go, oh, look, propaganda. I mean, I can't watch the TV. I haven't watched the TV for 20 years. But when I do, my mind is on hyper alert. And it's going propaganda. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's a lie. That and that's brilliant because that keeps me safe. That stops me from being drawn into the hypnosis. Yeah, you've just reminded me of every time I went to Spain on holiday, I used to get so angry with the TV 
because the propaganda, and I, it hasn't really changed much, the propaganda in Spain, I mean, I don't watch the TV over here, so I don't know what it's like these days, but the propaganda in Spain was so insidious on the television. And I used to get so irate. They're treating me like I'm stupid. Yeah. The, you know, really, they're talking to me like I'm a simpleton. And uh, the uh, the last time I went to Spain, uh, my family there, they, the television is on all the time from morning till evening. Very common here, yeah. And they're they're like they're like sponges. Mm -hmm. The manipulating is so easy when you're not there. Sure. You know, they can just bypass you straight to your subconscious. <laughs> sure. And and they've done lots of I mean, you know, I mean, let's let's be honest. They've done an awful lot of study about how to do this. You know, if if I know how to manipulate through language and I'm just, you know, just a basic hypnotherapist, they know a lot. So they've they've in, you know, they changed, they went digital, the te the televisions went digital. Before they were digital, they had a flicker rate. The flicker rate, which is just basically you, you think you're you're watching a solid image, but you're not, it's flickering. And what that flicker rate would do would be to induce hypnosis in people. Um and it would take typically people sitting in front, you know, five minutes to 10 minutes for them to enter into a very deep hypnosis and then bam, bam, bam. Now with digital TV, the flicker rate has increased immensely. And now people are, can go into hypnosis within 30 seconds of sitting with the TV. They wow. know that. 30 seconds and in, in quite deep hypnosis. But not just that, it's unaware hypnosis. If you don't know you're in hypnosis, you know, for example, if, if I said to you, Sal, why don't we do some hypnosis, right? I want you to relax yourself, listen to the sound of my voice, all of that. You know you're going into hypnosis. So your your guardian on the gate is aware. And so if mm. if I then I say, and I want, you know, I want you to believe that, you know, you were going to give me the numbers on your credit card, the guardian on the gate comes running out and saying, uh, I'm calling bullshit. Yeah. But if you don't know you're being hypnotized, mm. you've got no reason to question, you know, and that's, for example, I, I tell you something that, that and for people who are listening, they can watch out for this. There's a there's a very, very powerful technique called the power of three. And it's used all of the time in hypnosis, all of the time, which is the system is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them and then tell them what you've told them. So you tell them three times. Now that's, I use it all of the time in hypnosis. It's like, it embeds the suggestion. But if you if you just have to think back to the, the mad days when we were all locked in our houses, the slogans that they came up with, they always come up with three word slogans or three part slogans. Yeah. Um, you know, hands, face, space. You know, the, the love, the little three words, the mean nothing. Yes, we can. It means nothing, but it it's very powerful for, for the unconscious mind. So you've got to always be watching out for this when you see people repeating these th three words. Three, yeah. Yeah. The Father, the Son, and the yeah. Holy Spirit, you know. It's okay. like I like that. I like that for... Um... I write a lot of articles. I'm not very good. I've, you know, I've just been doing it the last few years. I'm learning. But I've heard that before, that tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them what you've told them, and then sort of like you tell them, and yeah. then you tell them what you've tell told them. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. like that. And I need to focus on that. Yeah. Um, on, a, on a separate issue. It's not a separate issue, but uh, on the same issue, but from a different angle. The way that we speak with people, it's really important. You know, you talk about hypnosis. Mm -hmm. I, I talk about manipulation, same thing. Um, but it's also the unconsciousness in which we speak that reinforces the space we're in. Because my focus is always ego. Mm -hmm. So if, if we wish to be able to move out of ego 
I'm not saying deny ego, but to move beyond ego so that we can see ourselves in perspective, mm -hmm. then how we use language is so important. And there's a very basic one. This is really, really basic, which my mom taught me years and years ago when I was young. And in Spanish, it goes, y el burro delante para que no se canse. Okay. Okay. Sí, sí. Which in English is, and you put the mule in front so it doesn't get tired. Exactly. And so it's something I've always been on the lookout for. Uh, I'm sorry to say my children haven't learned that in spite of my mm -hmm. having shared this with them many years, which is that they always put themselves first in a conversation. They always say, me and so-and-so. Yeah. Rather than say, uh, fulanito, menganito y yo. Yeah, huh? him, the other. Um, so rather than put ourselves in context, and there's no particular virtue to this, mm -hmm. but what it does is it makes us aware that we are talking with another person. So we now put ourselves in a perspective where we we move our ego to the back of the queue. So it's a deliberate thing, but the process of doing it there is no particular virtue signaling. It's simply that it helps us to be more aware of ourselves. Simple things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree. And, you know, I, I did a course on uh, the Dale Carnegie course, and it was beautiful. Uh, and he wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And one of the, the golden rules of Dale Carnegie is that the, a person's name is the sweetest smelling rose that you could ever offer them. Okay, it's the sweetest sound ever to the person. And so he always used to say when, you know, and the person, let the person um, feel important. Okay, and as you say, it's not virtue signaling. It's kind of, if you, if you want to manipulate somebody to get the very best out of that person, imagine I talk to somebody and I say, I want to find out everything that this person knows. I want to know what they know. The only way I can do that is by helping them to open up. Of course, you're going to use as much manipulation as you can, you know, with good intention to get it, you know, so using the person's name, um, letting the person feel important and valuable. It's incredible the change that, that you can get in people, you know, whereas if, as you say, if it's all like, you know, well, I'll tell you what I think, you know, in my humble opinion, which is never humble, is it? <laughs> People say that. <laughs> Listen, a couple of a couple of things. Um, you were talking about uh, manipulation and communication. And another thing that we that people do and they don't do it on purpose, I don't believe, but they do do it a lot, which is somebody will say to you, well, you know, you know, right now, they're telling you that you know, and you don't know. Okay, so in one one way, that actually makes you feel inadequate, because you think your mind saying, well, I don't know, unless you realize what they're doing, you know. But also, if you nod your head, you've agreed to whatever it is, they're going to tell you that you're going to accept that as a belief. You know, yes, yes, yes. So whenever, for example, when I when somebody says to me, you know, my mind says, no, I don't. Explain it to me and I'll listen, you know, so that they, they, they always have just, you know, you know, but we, we do it as a natural thing. But as long as. <laughs> no, I don't know. Explain it to me. <laughs> exactly. As long as people are going to do it. But as long as you protect yourself against it. Yeah. It's like when somebody says, I'll, I'll ask a, a client. How do you feel right now? How are you feeling? And they say, well, you know, you feel really bad, don't you? And and I, I'm thinking, that's the wrong pronoun. I want to hear, I feel really bad. And so I'll have to, often I'll stop them and I'll say, I want you to talk about you, not about me. Because if you, you know, if you accept, you feel really bad. You accept that, suddenly this is about you. And it's not about the other person. So pronouns are very important when we're in conversation about what are we projecting something onto somebody or are we 
hiding away from our emotions as well because it's people do it to hide away from the emotion as you were talking about you know the, the, the ego people will start using you instead of i and then that's third person and that's that's easier to manage you know whereas when you say i feel really bad <laughs> you know i've got a guy who um, comes and helps us around the place and uh, every time he came in in the morning he would say how are we doing and I'd look at him and says, who's this we? <laughs> <laughs> it took weeks before he, he got the message. Sure, yeah. <laughs> I'm okay. I don't know about you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the way that we limit ourselves is really important. And the way we use words to limit ourselves. Um, when, when I was a young lad, um, as most people are, one of my words would be, oh, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I went away to this um, commune, to give it a, a lack of a better word. I, I was away for a year. And uh, whilst I was there, um, I took on board, I'm going to learn how to uh, spindle uh, wool okay uh -huh. and that requires quite a bit of coordination and I started doing I couldn't do it and it took five days and then one day suddenly it was easy my body had now poof. and after that I learned this one word I can do anything as long as I am interested enough. Sure. Yeah. And afterwards, in conversation with people over the succeeding years, I would say, yeah, I can do anything. And they would look at me like her huh, big head. And I realized that we've got these sort of filters in us that... Uh, we 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 are self limiting. Yeah. We're constantly self limiting, and re and and the freedom comes when we use the appropriate words. Of, yeah. in this instance, I can do anything, with a caveat. Absolutely. As long as I'm interested. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether it's something physical or um, you know language or whatever you know learning and. Any, any discipline, all it takes is, am I interested? Absolutely. Absolutely. But if I say I can't do it, I've had it. <laughs> doors the closed, it. isn't it? The doors closed. That's it. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I'll give you an example of my, um, I, I've, I went through that process of understanding that, that yes, I can do anything I set my mind to if, if I'm if I'm enthusiastic about it, if I want to do it, if I don't want to do it, blurry hell, there's nobody can make me do it. Um, but I, I was aware that I was brought up, and then many many people are brought up in what's called poverty consciousness, and that's another limitation, which is we don't believe that there's enough. We're in lack, you know, and and that can manifest in many ways. My father would tell me that there wasn't enough money, that he wasn't Rockefeller, that money didn't grow on trees, that we didn't, we couldn't afford that, we didn't have the luxury of having that. Yeah. Exactly. So I was brought up thinking money, and not only that, but he would, he would talk very badly about rich people. So he would deny them their riches, and so I took that on board, and that's how I spent the first, let's say, the first thirty years of my life. Uh, until I realized that I was doing it all wrong. And suddenly, once I realized that I actually can manifest whatever I want in my life, I can manifest anything I like, you know, if I do the do the work and I'm, I'm excited enough about it, I completely changed my life. I never had any money for the first half of my life. I earned money, but I never had any. It just used to disappear. And then I, I made this shift in my head of I can have anything I want, you know, I can have anything I want. I don't want everything. You know, and as I've gone on, I made the big mistake of manifesting things, which I did for, very well for about 20 years, manifesting things. I had things everywhere. You know, I was a thing person. 
And then I then I realized I've made a big mistake and I should have been manifesting happiness. And then that changed everything again. But um, it, it's a, it is a, a limit. We limit ourselves constantly just through the words that we use, the thoughts that we have. And we we take it from the people who are important to us. Often we'll take those limitations off them and carry them. So you said the word pretty thing. Sorry, no, you said the word thing. And I wrote a whole lot of little things before little things before we started and uh, about the way we use language uh -huh. and the ego, the way that we use language as ego in relation to other people, everything is objects, is everything is a thing. So when we are, when we have children, we say, aren't you a pretty thing? Sure. Yeah. Because literally we see them as objects. We don't see them as their individuality that they are. Mm -hmm. uh, they... We, we um, in, in terms of relationships, we, we claim to love others. I say we claim because, you know, uh you can't love anyone else unless you can love yourself so sure. um a word i love you so much i could eat you i mean you know the phrases we hear i love you so much i could eat you uh okay <laughs> because we don't see other people we think we do you know but the filter but we're not. They're just objects to be manipulated. Uh, so there, everything is a thing around us. Mm. Uh. Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that there's a there's a um, there's a word here in Spain that's becoming um, uh, being become popular, which is I think the verb is cosificar, which is to make a thing of some body. You know, and I think the only version in English would be to thingify them, you know, make everything All into right. a thing, you know, make people into things. Um, yeah, and I think that if, you know, if I understand our journey, uh, our journey is is not an external one. And, you, you know, you made reference that we, we kind of project onto other people. We, we, we compare ourselves to other people. And the real journey is the journey inside within to find out to find out exactly who we are and but not to change to accept exactly who we are and you know it's a, you know it's that story of um the the man the man who was ter had a terrible life he was just so naughty so bad so terrible and his family and his friends would say you've got to change You've got to change. It's, you can't carry on like this. And no matter how he tried, he couldn't change. And then finally, one, he felt so bad. He just knew he felt bad about himself. Finally, one day, his friend came to him and said, you know what? I'm sorry. Just stay the way that you are. I love you anyway. And it was in that moment that he was able to change. You know, and I think that's the, the idea of going inside, finding out who we are, loving who we are, change then happens automatically. We don't need to work at change, that kind of change. You know? True. Mm. True. Yeah. I mean, that is the ultimate lesson, that ego cannot change ego. All we can do is accept who we are, and out of that observation and acceptance, we change naturally. True. Sure. Because we, we are... We're in a world of rules and regulations, and the expectation is that we're sinful and that we're bad. And so we need to be controlled and we need to control ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we're constantly fighting our nature to behave within a certain contained parameter of how to be. Whereas the reality is that when we're in the heart, when we see others truly, as well as seeing ourselves, we don't want to hurt anyone. Why would we? Because we don't want to be hurt ourselves. 
Sure. So why would we want to do this to others? You know, we can identify with their pain. So why on earth would we want to hurt someone else? So there is no need for the Ten Commandments or any commandment. No. It's it's our nature. Everybody's nature is a good nature. It's simply allowing ourselves to be who we truly are. And I, that's the difficulty in our day and age. I agree. To trust that to trust ourselves. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I I, I often talk about the, the the golden rule, you know, which is do unto others as you would have them do to you, which is exactly what you're talking about. And the the common law, which is I do you no harm, you do me no harm. You know, there's only one line to them. They're not complex at all. They're just very standard things, you know. And yet, and <laughs> yet, to arrive there and live by that standard, good grief! You can take a, you know, it takes a, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. It does. There's one other to add to your list. Don't lie to yourself, or better still, be truthful with yourself. You know. Um, I, I know for me it was a struggle when I was younger that um, I would often lie. And it was a struggle for me to then out loudly say to the other person, I'm sorry, what I've just said was not true. And then repeat it and just take the heat. True. You know, I've just lied. Because it's automatic. Often we lie automatically because... We don't want to appear that we're so poor, whether it is physically, psychologically, uh, intellectually, financially, whatever it is. Yeah. You know, always keeping up with the Joneses in some way or other. And so we are constantly lying and we're not even aware. And if we give ourselves permission to be truthful with ourselves, and to start to notice, actually, you know, I am lying. I'm, I'm saying things which are not truthful. Why am I doing this? You know, really begin to notice the deficiencies in our character. You know, it propels us forward very fast. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, they do say that as as you get older, you have less need to tell lies. <laughs> you know, it becomes easier to be truthful as you get older, <laughs> and that's why we we get. You know, you get those miserable old men who go, I'll tell you exactly how it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something in that. Absolutely. So there, there, there are some other words um, which are really important, um, especially for people who have young children. Um, we often, you know, as human beings, we are lovingly deficient we don't have enough love in ourselves sure. and we are a little bit parasitical uh, we're a little bit vampire like and so when we have children whether they're our children or are part of our family's children we often go to them and we say come and give mommy or daddy or auntie or uncle a kiss it would be so much better if we could go to them and say, can I give you a kiss? Can like, can I do something for you? Sure. Can I say this to you? Can I share with you? Rather than give me, give me, what can I give you? Yeah. 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 That's and nice. Especially with young children, especially with young children who need, they are desperate to be loved. You know, that's just how it is. They're desperate to be loved. And that's how it should be, you know. A plant needs plenty of water and sunshine and nutrients yeah, to grow strong. And so we should be loving our children, to, not to death. <laughs> I love you to death. <laughs> that's, that's going too yeah. far. That's going too far. <laughs> so should we, we should be loved. And, and again, it's not that we should be. You know, we also often do that. I should do this. No, there is no should. But it is for their benefit as much as our benefit to to give them of our love rather than to demand their love yeah. for them to love us, which we do all the time. We use words like this. Yeah. Love me. How We do that with our partners. How much do you love me? You know, <laughs> love me. 
rather than I love you. Uh-huh. You know, it's like focus on the giving rather than the taking. Yeah. Yeah, I agree entirely. Uh, you know, my a lot of my work is focused on helping people to overcome the lack of love and approval from childhood, you know, and, and I see in, in my, in, through my filters that children just need two things. They need love, they need approval. If they get them, sorted. If they don't get them, dodgy. And, you know, once, and the, the, the strange, the little journey that people have to go through, and I, I've been through it, and I'm sure, I know you've been through it as well, is is that we don't get what we need. We go through life in deficit because we think that we needed that love and approval from our parents. And then we get to a point where we realize that the only person that needs to love and approve of us is ourselves. And that's set you, then you become free again. And, you know, but that, that journey is a tough one. It's a tough journey. And, and you end up doing, you, you end up selling your soul quite often to get that approval and that love and making big mistakes and, and going with the wrong people. I, um, years and years ago, I had one client. It was a woman, she was in her 50s. She had a family of her own. And she was really, really stressed out and distressed and things were not going right. And she was dividing her time between her family and her mother, who wasn't very well. I don't know how critically bad she was. She did have other other sisters. But she was spending a lot of time focusing on the mother to the neglect of her husband and children. Mm -hmm. And what it turned out was she was desperate for her mother to love her. Her mother had never loved her. I mean, I'm sure her mother did love her in some part of herself, but she never felt loved by her mother. And so she was going out of her way just hoping that her mother would now love her. Yeah. Sad. Because it wouldn't it will never happen. Uh-huh. Because she's no longer a child. She's a grown up. Exactly. It's the child that wants to love. The adult, even if the adult got the love, it doesn't I mean lots of people I work with, and I'm I'm aware of the time. I think you know we'll probably have to bring this. Yeah. To yeah. an end, but lots of people that I work with, they say, Oh, my relationship with my parents is great now, but they're still very, very in deficit. It's the child. The child was was the bit that didn't get it, you know. And so once once you sort that out, then they can be free again and, and everything. But uh yeah, for probably another conversation for another time. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes, I mean we could go on with this. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yes. So that was a, another fascinating conversation. I'm sure there'll be many more. You know, there's so many subjects that we can we can talk about. But thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. You're welcome. And okay, so we'll we'll arrange, you know, another time we'll finish. and uh everything we'll finish, for the yeah, moment. Yeah. Bye bye everyone from my channel. Bye. And bye bye everyone from <laughs> and goodbye from, goodbye from mine, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you for listening.